I really appreciate your patience and your attention to what I've been talking about for the last several weeks. I don't believe, I don't know, I don't think it's possible for everyone to agree with me, at least to begin with. But what I would plead for you to do is when I say something that you disagree with, rather than rather than go back to wherever it is that you learn the opposition to what I'm saying, look at the scripture. Look at scripture because we'll we'll talk about that as we go on here. <clears throat> but I want to talk about reasoned faith. And guys, all of you right here, I want to thank you for praying for me to have truth in what I say. Don't stop doing that. Every one of you, please, say the same thing. It's so important that we, when we speak for God, that we speak the truth. I'll tell you what I told Randy and Darla and Gary and Mary Saturday. I have been praying lately. Because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm an old coot. I'm getting, getting toward the end of my life. And there's some health difficulties. And I've chosen this time to teach this. And there's some opposition to me teaching this publicly right here, right now. But my fear is that I'm going to leave this world without having done what Paul said. That he, he told them everything they needed to know for salvation. I don't necessarily think this is a salvation issue, but I think it's something that greatly, greatly expands your faith if you understand what I'm saying. Go back to the scriptures and check to see whether I tell you the truth or not. Reasoned faith, faith cannot be attained. Proper faith cannot be retained without reason. The Lord said through Isaiah, at a time when the people were so desperately in need of, of, of wisdom from God, they were about to be destroyed again, and though a lot of things were happening to them, the Lord said through Isaiah, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. That's what I want us to do. Why do we have faith in anything? What gives you a a trust in something? What makes you uh, feel like you can count on something? The scripture that Bubba read is extremely important because it, it shows individuals throughout time that have believed in God. We're going to start with Abraham and then we're going to go back and look at the rest of it. Who's got Jackson's? Okay. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. And it was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. He considered... Okay, stop right there for a minute, but... When it talks about Abraham, Abraham was promised a lot of things. And by the time we get to this point in Abraham's life, he's a very old man. And many, many things have happened to Abraham. If you go back and you look at at his life, he was first called by God to leave his home and to go into a foreign land. He did it. He trusted God. And everything worked out for Abraham when he did. When he got in trouble with uh, Pharaoh... Uh, It was Abraham's fault, but when he got in trouble with Pharaoh, he trusted God and everything turned out all right. When he did the same thing again with Abimelech, he trusted God. After he got in trouble, he trusted in God and everything turned out all right. When Abraham's nephew Lot was taken captive by the kings that were uh, invading the land of Canaan, Abraham took 318 men and chased four kings and their armies and won. He trusted God. Now when it comes to this situation right here, he's called, to do upon, called upon to do something that is unbelievable. 
Nobody's ever been asked to do this before. And Abraham considered. He thought. He looked back and thought. He looked at what was being asked of him at the time. And he looked forward with his thinking. Abraham considered. Go ahead, buddy. Where were we? Okay. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. As far as Abraham was concerned, his son was dead. His son was dead in his mind before he ever started down with that knife and before the angel ever stopped him. So let's read Romans chapter 10, starting with Weston. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on the law shall live by that righteousness. This is kind of a difficult statement because most of us don't believe that they were saved in the Old Testament. Well, let me ask you, was there forgiveness of sins in the Old Testament? Absolutely. Was the sin that they were forgiven of, was it paid for in the Old Testament? No. They were forgiven of their sin. They no longer had to deal with that sin once God said, you are forgiven. But those sins, those sins still were on the books and still had to be paid for. Now, the people in the Old Testament, they were living by a law where they trusted that if they did what God said, they would be saved. They weren't saved by their words, though. They were saved by that trust in God. So it says, Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. They obeyed God's law. They trusted God's law. And because they trusted it, they were saved. Their payment, the payment for their sin was not made. But they were saved from the guilt of their sin. So go ahead and read, Quentin. There's a but there, right? Oh, I love those buts. There. This is important. What does it say? But the righteous, based on faith, speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. Hmm. Raise your hand if you understand that completely. <laughs> That's a toughie right there. But I think, I, I think I finally understand this. He says, don't say in your heart, who will who, ascend into the heaven that is to bring Christ down? What do you think is meant by that? What, what, what could that actually, how could a human being actually think this right here? Who will ascend to heaven? Who has the authority, the power to go to heaven and send Jesus to this earth or send God to this earth in the form of a human being to save us? Who has that authority? Who has that power? Uh, Nobody. And who can say, who can go down into the abyss and bring Christ up from the dead? That's what got everybody's attention when Jesus went into the grave and then was brought out of that grave. That demonstrated the power of God in an unbelievable, you can tell it was unbelievable because most people didn't believe it. Unbelievable until it was proven by somebody that did something that was equally impossible and was telling them the story about Jesus. So what did that take? Austin, would you read, buddy? But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Hmm, the word of faith which we are preaching. Word of faith. The word having to do with faith. Or the word that produces faith. We're talking about hearing a story that is unbelievable, but it's been proven in the past. We're hearing that story and it's producing in us a confidence in something. A confidence like it said in the beginning of Hebrews. 
Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. What, does it ha- what do you have to have to have a hope in something? There are elements involved in hope. Somebody tell me what the elements of hope are. Well, you, well trust. Hey, yeah, yeah, you have to. That, but that's the end product of it. What are the elements that produce it? You hear it, okay? Expectant desire. What's that? Expectant desire. Expectant desire. That's two things, though. Hope and expectation. Hope and expectation. You know, you can hope for something, but if you have no expectation, no reasonable expectation of it ever happening, it can't be hope. If you want it, but it'll never happen, that's not really hope. That's why people lose hope. They have high expectations of something that will never come to pass. Expectation and a desire. Because you can expect something to happen. Expecting your tire to blow out while you're on a trip. Ah, Because your tires are not so great. But you can't call that a hope. I mean, that's not anything you hope for. So it takes those two things to produce this faith. Faith is the assurance of things you hope for and that you expect to come to pass. Oh, Seth, would you read, buddy? That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Oh, boy, that sounds like, that sounds like faith only. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. How does that play out to be true? Is it just some mental recognition that Jesus is Lord that makes us be saved? Is that what it is? Is that how it happens? I want you to look at the words that are used here. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord. What does Lord have to do with? What do we mean when we use the word Lord? How does it apply to our lives? The word Lord has to do with who we look to. Who we call upon. Who we understand has authority over our lives. And so if we understand, if we confess that Jesus is Lord, that's us doing something in the direction of what we, it says, you believe, believe. This word is translated believe. And that leads people to believe. It's a switch that you throw in your mind. Yes or no. But this is not a switch that you throw in your mind. This is a trust. I was thinking about how in the world to explain this. Notice what it says. If you confess with your, with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you trust in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I've always liked the illustration of a rope bridge, a suspension bridge across a ravine. You're trying to get from here to there. And in the middle of this is this great deep ravine and there's gators at the bottom of it. (laughs) And you're looking at that bridge and it's got the ropes are frayed and the the boards are not looking all that great. And you say, I, I, I think I can get across that. Well, it's the only way you ever know whether you really trust that bridge or not is whether you walk across it. If you trust in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, if you trust that He is Lord, if you trust what He said to do, if you trust everything about what it meant that the the eunuch was preached Jesus to him by Philip, what was the first thing? (laughs) The first thing that the eunuch said after Philip finished preaching to him. Ah, hey, there's water. 
What keeps me from being baptized? Trusting in the Lord means trusting what he said to do. You remember what he said to his disciples? Just before he ascended into heaven, he says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing men in uh, uh, every nation, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus was telling them what it meant to trust in him. If we trust in him, he'll be with us to the end of the age. Devin, would you read for me, buddy? For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Can you see how the word trust, which is the first definition that I found in every lexicon I've ever read. Trust is the definition of this word believes. Whoever trusts in him. What does it mean to trust in someone? Does it mean to ignore what they tell us to do? Does it mean that nothing else matters that we say we trust in this person? When we have trust in something, it means we're laying something on the line for that. Continue. Who's got this one? Oh, I'm sorry. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. For whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. I would like for every one of you to go back through the Old Testament and look at how this term calling on the name of the Lord or calling on his name is used. Every time it means subjecting themselves to the authority of the person that they're calling upon. Subjecting themselves to whatever rules or order is called upon. It's extremely important that we understand that. Wesley, would you read, buddy? How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. You know, I kind of smiled when I read this. Paul saying, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. The gospel is what he was talking about. And I thought about Paul's description of himself in Galatians chapter 4. He said, I I marvel at you that you accepted me as an angel of God when you you could have just puked when you saw me. (laughs) He must have been (laughs) ugly. Just... Oh, I I can't even imagine what he looked like after being stoned and left for dead. He said it just, he was hideous looking, but he said, you did not do that. You accepted me as an angel of the Lord. The good news of the gospel is what made this man beautiful. His spirit is what made him beautiful. The news that he brought is what made him beautiful. Daniel, would you read, buddy? However, they did not all heed the good news. Is, you know, we're individuals, right? Every one of us have access to this news, this good news, the information that comes from God. It's not just the gospel. It's the history behind the gospel. It's the plan of salvation from Genesis right on through until today. All of it has to do with how we are saved by the God of heaven. And each one of us must take all of this and reason it out. Reason. God said through Isaiah, Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. It's important that we understand that God's word is reasonable. Go ahead, read. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. Faith comes by hearing. Trust. 
comes from hearing and hearing from the word of God. I'm not going to see Jesus after he raised from the dead. I'm not going to see the miracles that Jesus performed. I'm not going to see those things myself. But do you remember what he said to Thomas when Thomas said, I'm not going to believe unless I can touch it, unless I can see it with my own eyes. And finally, the Lord called Thomas to him and says, come here, buddy. (laughs) Put your hand in here. Thomas said, my Lord and my God. He finally realized who he was and who he had been. He understood that everything that Jesus claimed was true. He understood that he was going back to the Father. He understood the relationship that he had with this Son of God that had come to save the world. How many of them do you suppose did not feel ashamed of themselves after Jesus ascended into heaven? There was a film out some time ago. I can't remember the actor's name, but he's the guy that played Herbie, uh, the uh, the love bug driver. <laughs> uh, somebody give me his name. I, I can't remember who he was. Huh? Dean Jones, yes, Dean Jones. He has a film that he did where he he plays the Apostle John on Patmos. That's the name of the film. It's called John on Patmos. And in that, he talks about how the how the Jews and how the Gentiles rejected Jesus. And then he starts crying. He said, but so did we. And we knew we were there. We were with him. I can't imagine how they felt after the Lord accepted them back. After running, after deserting him when he was dying. So, now... Trust comes from hearing. The Lord said to Thomas, You believe because you put your hand in the holes in my side? Well, blessed are those who don't have to do that. To believe. That, folks, is us. We gain our faith by hearing, by reading, by experiencing the Word of God. By looking at the lives of those who are a light unto the world. By understanding by all of the evidence that God puts before us. But heavily, heavily on his word. Does somebody have this passage, John 1, 9? This is after I had given the assignments. John, the Lord's best friend, writes this. There was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. There's not a man on earth today, not a person on earth today that cannot be enlightened by the Lord Jesus. He is still shining a light for everyone in the world. He was in the world. The world was made through him. And the world did not know him. He came to his own. I don't know how many ways this is true. Well, I, I know they're true, but I'm not sure what it's referring to here. He came into his own. Is that his own people, the Jews? Is that his own world that he created? Is that, I, I don't know how to apply that, but all of those things are true. He came to his own creation And those who were his own did not receive him. This word receive. It's an interesting word. Do you realize how many words that we have that come from that sieve? Receive. Conceive. Deceive. Perceive. All of those words that have to do with somehow grasping or holding on to. Those who were his own did not receive him. 
I thank you, my love. <sighs> Glad I got somebody to take care of me. He came unto his own, and those who were his own did not grasp him, did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. See, just the mental ascent that he was, who he claimed to be, didn't make you a child of God. But it certainly gave you the right to become a child of God. Even to those who trust in his name or his authority, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of God, will of man, but of God. There's a process by which we come from the world, by which we're called. The word for church is the Greek word that has two Greek words combined, ek, which is out of, and kaleo, which is called. We're called out of the world by that good news, that gospel that Paul was referring to. When we're born again, we're not born like a human being is born with a father and mother. We're born, we're born spiritually by the will of God. I want to ask the question, what do you think blind faith is? What would you call blind faith? How would you, what would you say that would be? I want to use a couple of examples. I think it's trusting with no evidence to support the trust. When you believe in something pie in the sky, where, where there's no support for it. There's no reason to be believing that. We, I just do, you know, I, I just do. Well, guess what? So did Danny and so did Eve. When I was in Germany, I had a very good friend. This kid was about the most handsome kid I think I'd ever seen. He was a California beach boy. Everywhere he went, people just, whew, wow. Huh. <laughs> he was smart. He had everything in the world going for him. Two weeks after I left Germany, I got word that uh, Danny had taken some LSD and believed that he could fly out of a third story window. Guess what? Danny couldn't fly. He had no reason for that faith. There was nothing on this earth except a deceiver to convince him that he could fly out of a third story window. But you know, he's no different from Eve. Look at the story of Eve. Tommy, would you read your part? Now the serpent was more crafty than... <coughs> Now the serpent was more crafty than the beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said, The woman indeed what has God said. You, sh you shall not eat from the any tree of the garden. Okay, the stop there a minute, buddy. This serpent, well, we know it was Satan. We know who it was. But it says he was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? Go ahead and read mine. The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it or touch it. You will die. Hmm. What did God say? The serpent asked the woman, what did he say to you? 
So the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden, we, we can eat. But, there's that word again. But from the fruit of the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat from it or touch it or you'll die. She knew what God had said. I mean, she heard it firsthand. She heard exactly what she should have trusted in because here's her creator, her provider, the person who had given them everything and had built a hedge around them. That's what paradise actually means. It means a hedge around. So here she is in this place, the kind of place that the Satan accused God of doing for, for Job. Well, why wouldn't he obey you? You build a garden for him with a hedge around it. Just take that away from him and see what he does. Well, she knew what God had said. So, John, would you read? The serpent said to the woman, you, you surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she, also, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. Okay. Did Eve do the same thing that Abraham did? Did she consider? Yeah, yeah, because we read about what she's considering right here. But let's back up a little bit and read this. It says, For God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Up, up until this time, all they knew was good. They had been given, ingrained in their mind, the, the temperament, the thoughts, the, the image of God on their brain. Same thing every child is given today when they're born. They have the mind of God in itty bitty form. <laughs> but they're good. There's nothing evil about it. And Satan said, God knows that if you eat of this, was he lying to her here? No, he was telling her a truth, but a deceitful truth, a truth in a deceitful way. Did he lie to her about dying? Yeah, yeah. Did she die physically that day? No. They lived 930 years if she lived same as Adam. So it wasn't that she was going to die physically that day, but there's more than one meaning for die. What kind of death did she suffer that day? She was separated from God that day. Separated from God because she did not trust God. She trusted this interloper here. Who had no reason. He gave her no reason for her to trust him. Except. She wanted something. She wanted something and he agreed with her. And because of that, she accepted his word instead of God's. That's what we all do. That's what we all do. We accept something other than what God says. And when we do, we're separated from God because we did not trust him. How do we get faith? What Paul write in Romans? We get faith today, not by seeing a miracle, not by experiencing the life of Jesus in our, ourselves, but we get the word through the written word of God, and we get faith by reading that. I want to I ask you to do something. If you disagree with something that I have said in this series of lessons, please go to the Bible, not back to where you got the initial information. If you go back to where you initially got it, you're going to get the same information. But go to the Bible and check the verses that I've used. Please. 
I don't want to run or have run in vain, if that sounds familiar to you. <clears throat> Let's get down. Verse 7. Who's reading that? Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. Guess what? Satan's words were true. Their eyes were opened. They did see good and evil now. The difference was God had made them pure. Had made them perfect. And they are the ones that trusted someone else and departed from God's plan and lost their souls. Why did she receive, <laughs> here we'll making a play on these root words, why did she receive the deceiver instead of God? Both of them have to do with grasping. Why did she grasp the one who is grasping rather than her creator? Because she wanted something. Because it was in her nature to get what she wanted as opposed to doing what she was told by God. Please, let's read the Bible. Let's search until we find the answers in the Scriptures. There's a lot of information. You know, I, I marvel at how much information is available on the internet today. But guess what? What do you have to do with all of that information that's on the internet? You've got to sift through it to find the truth. You can't say knowledge is increasing. You can say information is increasing exponentially in this world. But even with the increase of information, the work gets harder because you've got more garbage to sift through in order to find the truth. If we go back to the initial and make it make sense with itself. I've always said that the Bible is the best commentary on the Bible. Go back and find the origin of everything and follow it all the way through. It will give you God's truth on any subject. The lesson is yours. I hope that, I hope that I'm not just confusing people. Please stick with me. Well, I'm, I'm trying to get there. <laughs> I'm trying to get there is what I'm trying to get. So help me get there is my point. If you're not a Christian, if you've not trusted in the Lord and what he said to do to be saved, if you've not been born again, make this that beginning of a new life. Won't you come while we stand and sing the song that...